I don't know about you, but when something amazing happens, I have a tendency to want to shout it from the rooftops. Am I the only one that, that when I get some great news, I want to say, hey, did you hear? Um, something amazing happened, and that was the case this week. On Thursday, I was actually in Atlanta for a funeral, and uh, Sean had had his surgery on Wednesday, and so I was able to also just jog over and see Sean and Marilyn in the hospital, and I had not met Sean, and I had heard about the accident that he had back in September where they were not sure if he would live or die. And so you can imagine what I expected to see in that hospital room, right? Well, he is doing amazing. Now, I want to be clear, he has a long way to go, so don't, don't get the wrong idea on that, but he looked amazing. And I just wanted to shout it from the rooftop, the healing that had already happened in this young man's life. Continue to pray for that family as they continue to recover. Now, I feel the same way about what God is doing in my life. I hope you feel that way about what God is doing in your life. Now, I have shared a little bit about my journey in faith. I grew up in the church. I had a mom and dad who loved me enough, you heard that right, who loved me enough to take me to church every single Sunday, morning and night and Wednesday night. Amen. Uh, did anybody else have parents who loved them that much? Uh, I am so grateful for that, too, because I lost my way. When I was in college, there was a season where I wandered into the wilderness. I was the prodigal daughter. It was in that season I have made the worst mistakes of my life. I know you don't want to hear all of those, but I'm going to give you one little small example um, a young woman that I met in college, I think when you go away and you don't really know a lot of people, you're eager to make friends. And I befriended a young lady in my dorm. I had taken her home with me over the Thanksgiving break, so we're a few months into school now. And she was bored at my house. And so she talked me into lying to my parents. Okay, that was my choice, right? I, I made that choice. I'm not going to blame her. Let's hear that. I'm not going to blame her. Uh, but she made it sound like so much fun. that There was a party going on in her hometown, and uh, we would have an opportunity to have a wild time. And so I did something that I am not proud of. I lied to my parents. Has anybody ever lied to their parents? I lied to my parents. Now that is, maybe it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I value honesty and integrity and truth. And so that was a huge wrinkle in my fab the fabric of my life and my faith. And I, I did something I'm not proud of. We actually drove all night. We got lost driving in a blinding snowstorm. I was living in Rockford, Illinois at the time, and we were driving to the big city of Chicago. And we never could find the party. We got there with the wee hours of the morning. The party was over. Everybody was crashed all over the house. And so when the sun came up, we went to her mom and dad's house. And because I had been up all night, I developed a toothache. And it became clear that I was going to need to see a dentist. I was going to have to call my mom and dad to come get me in Chicago where I was not supposed to be. Are you following me? I got caught in my lie. Okay, has, has that ever happened to you? I got caught in my lie. But do you know what my mother and father did? They asked, where, where is this? Where do I need to come? They were not fond of driving in that big city, but they came and they got me. And do you know what I did not get when they arrived? A lecture. They knew I was in pain. They knew I was brokenhearted over having lied to them, and they loved me unconditionally. And that was one of the things that I remembered as I was returning to this God I loved was what unconditional love looks like. Even when we make a mistake, God loves us still. Amen? It was a beautiful lesson that they taught me. 
I talk about that season because it's part of what shaped me into who I am today. It's a part of my walk with Christ. Yes, there have been some big bumps in the road. Every day of our lives, we write a new page in our own story. And it's my prayer that we're going to see growth. That we move from who we are to who we want to be in Christ. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about five practices that if we do these five things, we will grow stronger in our faith. We close the gap between who we are and want to be in Christ. When we engage in these five practices, we worship God in public and private. We take steps to grow in our faith. We love and serve God and others. We give generously to God and others, and we share our faith with others. Today, we're going to focus on sharing our faith. We're going to look at two passages from Matthew, one from Revelation, but first, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your word spoken into our lives today. Amen. Hear now God's word from Matthew 4. I'll be reading verses 18 through 20. This is Jesus. Uh, As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I have a question for you this morning. Why does the church exist? If you read your emails this week, I asked you to be thinking about that question. Why does the church exist? Are we a social club where we just get together with the people we know and we love and we share a little time? Why does the church exist? I put this out there on social media and I got a wide range of answers. Most people were describing what they thought the church should accomplish, you know, their experience of church. And I I got things like, church exists so we can worship together. I'm like, yeah, that's true, that's good. To grow through preaching and teaching of God's word. I'm like, yeah, the church exists for that. It's a place where people who don't know about Jesus can find out about him. I'm like, yeah, I like that a lot. Church is an anchor. It's a calm in the storm. One person said a church is a place where you're loved, even when you're a misfit. The relationships you form feel very much like family. It's a place where we love and serve each other. And I thought, they must have been listening to my sermon. That's exactly why the church exists, right? We we exist for all those things, and these are all great answers to why the church exists. There are benefits of, of why we gather together as believers in Christ. It inspires us. It encourages us. But perhaps the most important reason that the church exists, the church exists to make disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. Now that begins with transforming me and you. The church exists to make disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. Our beautiful special music this morning talked about what we call the Great Commission. That was the name of the song, is the Commission by a group called Cain. And when Joan was asking me some of my favorite songs, that was one of my favorite songs. And so, of course, they immediately commenced to try to learn that song and sing that song. And I'm like, yay, thank you so much. It'll go perfectly today with today's message. It has a beautiful message. As Jesus was preparing to ascend to heaven, he gathered his disciples together and he said to those who believed in him, he said, 
go and tell the world about me, right? I remember that, go and tell the world about me. This is our purpose. This is God's plan. This is why the church exists. We're to go and tell the world about him. And here's the good news. We don't go alone. God's spirit is with us wherever we go. The church exists to equip us in our mission to make disciples of Christ. And the church equips us as we worship God in public and private, as we take steps to grow in our faith, as we love and serve God and others, as we give generously to God and others, and as we share our faith with others. Now, if we were to continue on in Matthew's gospel, our first passage was from the fourth chapter. After Jesus had gathered his disciples together, we see him doing all of these things. We see him worshiping God. We see him growing, serving, giving, sharing. Jesus worshiped God with others. Jesus taught them so they would grow in their faith. He, he showed them how to love and serve God by his example, right? By the things he did, we know what we're called to do. He gave generously to God and to others, and he, he shared his faith with everyone we met. That first passage in Matthew, come and see, he said. Follow me. As an example of how we're to live out our faith, here's some more advice from Jesus. Uh, these are some more words written in red from Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket. But on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We are a light, a city on a hill. We have been given the gift of salvation by faith in Christ, and this is our story. This is a story we're meant to share. We don't, we don't receive this gift, this light of the world, and then hide. Do we? Would you get much of a message if I spent the whole Sunday right here? No, I've got to talk about it, right? I've got to share the gift of God's light. We're called to be a city on a hill. Now, my story is going to be different than your story. You heard how I shared a story from my past about how I learned about God's unconditional love. That's how we share the gospel. I didn't come up to you and say, here's a pamphlet. Do you know where you're going to go if you die tonight? That's not how I shared it. I think what we learn from following Jesus in Scripture is, is about relationships. It's about forming relationships with people. Talking about how God is working in our lives. You know, my story is different than others, and I think each one of us has a different story. For instance, my husband, Kim, he grew up in the church and, and just was baptized as an infant. He always knew the faith. It, it was always part of his life. He never strayed. He's always been a good guy his whole life, you know? But he has had other watershed moments, like when he served on the Appalachian Service Project. He talks about seeing God's love in that moment. When he helped start a youth praise band, that's something God called him to do, and he talks about that as sharing his faith. Others may have come to faith later in life. I you know, was baptized in, by immersion uh, when I was 12. Even though I'd known that faith all my life, but no matter where we begin, we're all growing. And I hope we all see the ways that God is at work in our lives. This is our story. This is our testimony. Yes, did you hear that? I just sent it as a text to everyone. This is what we are called to share with others. 
It's our willingness to share our story with others that has the ability to touch hearts and change lives. When we're willing to be honest about those places we fell down and how, God, with God's help, we got up. Those are the most powerful stories. When others see that God loves us in our brokenness, they realize that God loves them in their brokenness. In chapter 12 in the book of Revelation, Satan is described as the great deceiver. I love the book of Revelation, and I love particularly this chapter 12. This is a, kind of a fresh account on the birth of Christ. That's the story for another day. But anyway, part of this, do you know what happens when this great deceiver is thrown down from heaven and is here to, to pursue us, to pursue you and me? Do you know how he's defeated according to Revelation? I want you to hear it in Revelation 12, 11. It says, but they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. The great deceiver of this world is defeated by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. That's how we change the world. We tell our stories. We tell our stories about how God loves us and saves us. Are we willing to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's our challenge this week. And I'm not talking about some canned speech that I give you. If you shared my story, it wouldn't be the same as if you share your story. So what is your story of faith in Christ? Have you ever stopped to think about the ways that God is working in your life? How you would tell others about it? This week's challenge is perhaps the hardest of all because if you are like me, I'm a good southern girl and I grew up and what were the two things I learned never to talk about? You know, right? Politics and religion, right? Now we've broken those rules, haven't we? Truth be told, we have probably heard somebody share the gospel in offensive ways, which breaks my heart when I hear that. This is a gospel of the love of Jesus Christ who overcomes our brokenness, who meets us where we are and will take us to the place we want to be if we would but surrender our lives. That's the story we want to tell. I don't want to scare somebody into heaven. I want to share the overwhelming, never-ending love of God. The kind of love that meets us where we are and shows us how to turn the mess that is our lives into a message of God's redeeming love. The kind of love that meets us in our grief and brokenness and just holds on to us until we're ready to take the next step in faith. Or, you know, there's another way that people share the gospel that I, I cringe every time I see it. They look down their nose at me. Well, it's good to have you back in church. What? We should be excited. We should, I, I don't want to, what are we saying when we say something like that? Instead, you know, we could say something like, so glad to have you today. You see the difference? So glad to have you today. Maybe we've heard the gospel from somebody who looks down our nose at us, somebody who thinks they are better than someone else. Here's the truth that's hard to hear. We are all sinners. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a beautiful quote about this in his book, Life Together, and I want to share that with you. It is the grace of the gospel which confronts us with the truth and says you are a sinner a great desperate sinner. Now come as the sinner that you are to God who loves you. He wants you as you are. He does not want anything from you. 
a sacrifice, a work. He wants you alone. My son, give me thine heart. From Proverbs 23, 26. God loves us madly and deeply. That's what I want to share. I think too many of us get caught up in putting on a mask and letting people believe that we've got it all figured out, that our lives are perfect. Friends, my life is not perfect. Is your life perfect? When we're honest about what we struggle with, and how God is working with us through that struggle. That's our testimony. That's our story. And that's what we're called to share. I think that's why I love the Kairos prison ministry so much, is because we tell it all. We tell the worst things that ever happened to us, and we talk about how God loves us through us. The story we want to share is the story of a God who loves us madly, who meets us where we are, and moves us from where we are to where we want to be in Christ. So church, will you share your story with someone this week? With someone who needs to know about a God who loves us madly? A God who loves us no matter what. A God who knows we are not perfect. Do you know that there are no secrets with God? The thing you're hiding from me, God knows it. The thing you're hiding from your friends, God knows it. The thing you're hiding from your family, God knows it. When we put it, out there, when we let go of the shame of our mistakes, when we shine God's light on that, it can be redeemed. God can take that mess and turn it into a message of redemption. Are we willing to tell our stories? To tell of God's redemption. We aren't perfect, but we're growing, we're changing because of the love and mercy and grace of Christ. May it be so in our lives today. Amen.